Well, hey there, Story Fam. I'm so glad you're a part of today's worship service, whether you're in person at our Timber Grove campus or joining us online as part of the Stories Online campus. I'm really glad you're a part of this. My name's Eric. I'm the lead pastor of the story, and it's a big, uh, big week here at the church and for, for every church, really. Christmas time is a big time of year, and, and especially so for our church this year. And, and, and I'll explain and catch everybody up uh, to speed in just a moment. First, I just want to thank the crew that has made these pre-recorded messages possible. Um, and this is the last one of these that we'll do for this year. Um, and, and this was a huge pivot in our the life of our staff and our volunteers this year as we had to shift some of our resources around and shift some of our equipment around when we learned that we were moving. And I just wanna thank Brian Edwards, who's on staff with the story. He's our director of these um, uh, online messages and uh, the, the music that you've uh, worshiped with online as well. And Brian's in the booth with Kat Bruff, who's our uh, communications guru. and. and and also Julie Miller Courtois and, uh, and, and our camera guys, Guy is one of them, and, and uh, Rocky is here as well. And, and in the sound booth, we've had Roger and we've had Josh and, and other volunteers as well have pitched in uh, and, and staff have pitched in over the past several months. I just wanna say thank you. It has been hard work to do these every week and, and it's really made a difference and meant a lot to a lot of people. So I wanna, I wanna thank them and I wanna let y'all thank them as well. All right, this is also the, the last Sunday before Christmas, as y'all probably know by now. Believe it or not, Christmas snuck up on us again this year, and this Friday, we will have a full slate of Christmas Eve candlelight services. Five services across two campuses will also be online as well on Christmas Eve. But if you want to worship in person on Christmas Eve, join us this Friday, 1 p.m. at River Oaks, 2 p.m. at Timber Grove, 3 o'clock at River Oaks, 4 o'clock at Timber Grove, 5 o'clock at River Oaks. So five total services, and we've alternated them both by campus and by the, the hour uh, separation. It's going to be a great day, and I can't wait to, to lift those candles and to worship Jesus together and give thanks for his birth and just remember the events of that, uh, of that night. Um, so I can't wait to see you all on, on Friday. Now, finally, this is also... December the 19th, our last Sunday, worshiping at, uh, at 3471 Westheimer in River Oaks. After almost seven years of a wonderful time as part of St. Luke's family of ministries, the story's moving on, and this will be our last Sunday worshiping there. The reason I bring that up, obviously, it's a huge transition and everybody needs to know, but but from this point on, don't show up on Sunday mornings uh, hoping to find the story at 3471 Westheimer. Um, next Sunday, the 26th of December, we're gonna be gathered all together at Timber Grove for one special service celebrating Christmas again. It's gonna be beautiful, lots of carols and, and a great message. Uh, it's at 945 at our Timber Grove campus. And then for the first three Sundays of the new year, um, January 2nd, 9th, and 16th, we will have multiple services at Timber Grove to accommodate everyone coming together at the same place. So 9.45 and 11 o'clock on those uh, Sundays, the first three Sundays of 2022. And then the big day, the grand opening of our brand new campus in the Museum District. So the Story Museum District will open on January 23rd with three services at 8.30, 45, and 11. The building, the new building is located at 4910 Montrose Boulevard. I cannot wait for y'all to see this. We've been working, honestly, day and night to get this space ready. It's a lot of things to be updated and, and carpets changed and walls painted and things, things that needed to be freshened up a bit uh, before we can open up to the public. So I can't wait for y'all to see this space on the 23rd of January. All right, let's get to today's message because today we have, I have the, the real privilege of rounding out this series. This is the part four of four of this series called Overflowing with Thankfulness. And I've had a lot of fun with this series. I think it's been deeply meaningful and important. And we've, we've been talking about Paul's letter to the Colossians. So the Apostle Paul wrote a series of letters, 13 of which we have recovered and make up you know, a good portion of the New Testament. One of those letters he wrote around the year 60 AD, and he wrote it to a group of Christians living in Colossae, which uh, was, a, was a town in the Turkish region, um, and, uh, and, and Paul wrote to the Christians gathered there 
Um, he had never met them in person. He, had, he didn't start their church like he had at some of the other churches, but he was writing there uh, out of concern for them. He wanted to encourage them, but he was all, also concerned about them falling prey to what he called um, false teachers and false doctrines. And, and they were starting to, if you remember last week, they were starting to think about Jesus in terms of one of many. So Jesus is a helpful sidekick but he's just part of the recipe of attaining our own salvation, our own justification. And so they were doing Jesus plus something else. They were worshiping Jesus on Sunday and, and going to you know, a fortune teller on Monday, for example, to try and round out their uh, spiritual portfolio. Um, that's not how it works with Jesus. As we've said repeatedly in this series, he's your everything or he's your nothing. And that's really getting to the heart of the question that I wanna tackle with this Sunday's message. Every week I wanna tackle a big question that I've heard people asking in the real world. And today's question is pretty simple and to the point. What is it that is unique or special or even superior about Christianity? So every religious doctrine or every, every dogma, every, every faith tradition um, has core beliefs, core truth claims that distinguish it from all other truth claims and other religions. What is it about Christianity that's any different from Buddhism or Islam or secular humanism for that matter, or secular naturalism? What is it about Christianity that makes it any different or even any better? Shouldn't we think about world religions and faith traditions in, in the sense that, that they're all the same, they're all equal, all these different paths lead to the same place? Isn't that the more sensitive and sophisticated way to look at these things? The, the only way I can answer that is absolutely not. And even if I wasn't a Christian, I would want to answer that question that way because you can't take a, a, a varied um, you know, menu of different truth claims and call them all equal. Some of them must be truer than others, and maybe one of them is ultimately true. Our, our belief as Christians is that the Christian truth claim is, is the truth. The, the claims we make about Jesus set Christianity apart from all these other religions because Jesus himself is set apart from all the other religious founders and leaders, and, and we've been talking about what it is exactly that, that sets him apart. In, in the beginning, toward the beginning of this series, we talked about the humanity of Jesus, how he was really a person. And this is something that's important to remember because it's easy to think about Jesus with a halo and the glowing skin and the, the white robe up in the, up in the sky. Jesus was a real man who walked the earth. Historians and scholars have, have reached consensus about this. It's, it's almost un, universally agreed that Jesus physically walked the earth. He was a historical figure, that he was really born to a woman named Mary under some difficult or hard to explain circumstances, like how she got pregnant before she was married and all of that. Even secular scholars go along with that part of Jesus's story. And, uh, and, and so I think this is appropriate for us to reflect on at Christmas. Because this Friday, y'all, we're gonna get together and we're gonna sing those Christmas carols. We're gonna remember the Christmas story. We're gonna, we're gonna have our nativity scenes all set up at the church and you've got yours probably at home. We're gonna lift our candles to the sky and sing Silent Night. And I want us to have in our minds that the thing we're remembering, the event that we're celebrating on Christmas Eve is a real event that happened in history. It's not some mythology. It's not some religious fiction. Jesus was really born to a real woman named Mary, and so we, we commemorate uh, an actual historical event uh, every Christmas. Now, that's not to say that we humans haven't done what humans do and built on to the Christmas story. We've added on our own mythologies. Talked a little bit about that in the last couple of weeks. The innkeeper, the crotchety innkeeper with a no vacancy sign, not in the Bible. We just sort of snuck him into those Christmas pageants and plays and Charlie Brown's Christmas special, all of that. Like, not in the Bible, but it's, it's mythological additions to the scriptural story. Some of our Christmas songs, some of which we might sing this Friday night or this Sunday at Timber Grove uh, on the 26th. Some of those reflect a kind of uh, mythological uh, adding on. Uh, think, for example, about a lot of people's favorite Christmas song, Away in a Manger. 
which I'll never understand why that, of all the Christmas songs, why that would be your favorite. But I know people whose favorite Christmas carol is Away in a Manger. Think about that line, the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Really? <laughs> you really think, have you ever met a newborn baby? Have you ever been around a newborn infant? No crying he makes, really. That's actually medically a problem. If your newborn infant doesn't make any crying, that's unrealistic, that's problematic. Uh, obviously, you know, Jesus was a baby and obviously he would have made some crying, uh, unbeknownst apparently to the writer of Away in a Manger. <laughs> or think, for example, about the, the song that we close every Christmas Eve service with, Silent Night. So some of y'all are like, you better not mess with Silent Night. I'm not, I'm gonna be gentle, all right? But just that one little line, sleep in heavenly peace. I like to imagine Mary and Joseph up in heaven looking down at us singing sleep in heavenly peace. Like shaking their heads like y'all have no idea. Like remembering how little heavenly peace there was in their household on that first Christmas. And in the days that followed, they had a newborn and they were young new parents with no idea what they were doing. I doubt that they had much heavenly peace. Uh, I doubt that their nights were very silent at all. And then, of course, there's everyone's, I think, it should be everyone's least favorite Christmas carol, <laughs> The Little Drummer Boy. Uh, the logic of that song can be summed up nicely by this very popular internet meme, which says, Mary, exhausted, having just gotten Jesus to sleep, is approached by a young man who thinks to himself, what this girl needs is a drum solo. <laughs> That's pretty funny, okay. That's great. So what this girl needs is a drum solo. Yeah, I don't think uh, Mary or any new mom would appreciate a drum solo very much, okay? Jesus was a real baby. Mary was a real mother. And the birth of her baby represents something that truly is a difference maker. Not just religious speak, not just spiritual sap. It was a, a real event that makes a real Difference. And to find out what this means precisely, we're going to look at Colossians one more time in this series. This is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and then we'll skip to verse 13 through 15. All right. Paul wrote, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, this is the first thing that we've talked about already, but for, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ, okay? So let me back up, just make sure you're getting this. It says, the fullness of the deity lives in Christ. And then it says, and in Christ, you. So we talked about that last week, in Christ, you. What's the mystery of God revealed in Christ? Christ in you. So there's the second thing we've talked about that distinguishes Jesus. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Okay. So just to review, the first um, distinctive of, of Christianity that, that we covered in, in depth two weeks ago is the divinity of Jesus. You can't, really, um, you can't really call yourself a Christian and deny Jesus' identity as God in the flesh, as a man who was fully God, okay? So um, this is a core Christian tenet. It does set Christianity apart 
and Jesus apart from other faiths and other faith leaders. Because uh, what we're saying is Jesus is not like Muhammad, for example, who was a prophet. Jesus is not like Moses, for that matter, who was a leader of God's people. Jesus is, is not a, a teacher, you know, like, like Gandhi or like, uh, like the Buddha or, or anyone else. Jesus is God in the flesh. That's one of the things that distinguishes Christianity from other faith traditions. But you have to understand what else is there to make sense of why this matters at all. And the second thing that, that we talked about last week is the Christ in you. Right, so every faith tradition that's ever been, every religion across every human civilization has always known where their gods lived. The gods of every human tradition have always lived in the heavens, for example. The, the heavens, the skies, the, the constellations, the sun, the moon, the stars. Over time, uh, as religions developed uh, a little more sophistication, um, the gods started living closer among the people. So the gods were said to live on mountaintops and in forests among the trees or in the seas. And, and then um, eventually people, civilizations, started building houses for their gods. And we call them temples or shrines, usually temples. And, and the gods were said to live inside those buildings. By the way, it should be said that in the Old Testament, before Jesus, all of the things I just said about the gods of other faiths could also be said about Yahweh, the God of Israel. It was said that God uh, lived, Yahweh lived in the heavens, right? His, his residence is in the heavens. But it also says in the Old Testament that God lived on the mountaintop, the mountain of the Lord, Mount Horeb, um, or, or um, you know, in the, in, the, in the wind or in the fire, it said God dwelled. And then eventually the people of God built him a what? A temple. Because they saw other religions doing that for their gods, they wanted to honor their God as well. So they built them a temple in Jerusalem. Well, Christianity comes along and makes this extraordinary claim that God doesn't need a house anymore. God doesn't just live in the sky. God isn't just up on a mountain. That in fact, God, Christ, is in the heart of every believer. God has taken up residence in the heart, the soul, the mind of every believer. You are the temple of God's Holy Spirit, the Bible says. And this is another extraordinary claim that really is unrivaled by any other faith tradition. It's unprecedented, it's unmatched. The idea that God himself would take up residence in a person like you and me, uh, that, that's, that's extraordinary. It's truly a distinctive. But even that, those two facts, God is, uh, Jesus is God and, and Christ in us, living in us now. Those two things are interesting theologically, but not so compelling practically. It's the third component of this passage from Colossians that I think really changes the game. This whole part about being dead in your sins. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us forgave, past tense, forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our indebtedness, our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. Paul said he nailed it to the cross. The cross and what happened there is the most important, distinctive Christian truth claim for most people that I know today because the other stuff can be discounted as more mythology, more religion, more superstition. If you're really skeptical, it's easy to go there. But this component of the Christian truth claim is, is it's hard to ignore, it's hard to dismiss. We're talking about forgiveness, forgiveness. Now, how, uh, how, how, how often do we find it difficult, if not impossible, to extend forgiveness to someone who's hurt us? How, how, how often do you find it hard to forgive someone that you know should be forgiven? You know you should patch that up. You know you should mend that fence and, and rebuild that relationship, but whatever it is, just the pain that was caused, uh, the, the lack of healing that's happened in your heart, or your own pride even can get in the way of you extending forgiveness. You just don't feel like You've got it in you. I've heard people say, I would forgive them. Maybe one day I will forgive them right now. I just don't feel it. 
I don't have it in me to forgive them. And, and here we have Paul claiming that it's not really up to us in the first place. That because of Jesus' unique identity as God in the flesh, as, as, as God in the flesh on the cross, dying as a blood atonement sacrifice for every sin ever committed, it means that forgiveness as an act was never really in our hands or up to our discretion at all. That every sin has already been covered and any resentment or residual pain that we hold on to and hold against each other, well, that's just us. That's not the, uh, the economics or the debt that was created by their sin. It's been paid for by the blood of Jesus. And this is where we lose people. Some of y'all are like, why? Why did, did blood have to be spilled to prove that sins were forgiven? Why not, just, why not just say from heaven, God, why not just say you're forgiven? Why did blood have to be spilled, especially the blood of an innocent man? This is really, really hard for people to make sense of these days because we don't think of blood as an atoning substance. We don't think that we anymore have to offer sacrifices to atone for the sins we commit and the debts that we incur. However, I would encourage us to have a little bit of humility here and to realize that although we're not offering sacrifices, animal sacrifices in temples anymore, thankfully, because I would not be a good, I would not be a good knife-wielding priest. <laughs> I'm not good enough with a knife. But even though we're not doing that anymore, we still look at justice for sin the same way. Because all sin is, biblically speaking, is a violation of God's moral law. God's natural or moral laws are broken when we sin. And we all have this sense that when when laws are broken, be they moral or civil, um, however, legal codes exist for a reason, to, for, for the good of the whole, right? So whenever the law is broken, a debt is created, be it a debt to society or be it a debt to the aggrieved, to the one, the victim or the victim's family, right? We still command our pound of flesh. We still really believe in blood atonement. We just don't call it that anymore because we still believe when someone is guilty of a crime like murder, for example, they have a debt to pay. Or if you're driving home from, from church or from wherever this week and somebody rear ends you or they're on their phone and they run right into you and damage your car, and maybe there's medical bills, and you know that debt is theirs. And until they are made to pay it, there's gonna be something that's not right in the world there's gonna be something amiss. And, and that's really how the Bible communicates the economics of sin with us. When we sin, we violate the moral um, code of God. We violate the natural law of God. And, and so it incurs a debt. And how often have we done this? For how long have we violated uh, God's moral law? Every time we gossip, every time we have a, negative or violent thought about someone. Every time, every time we go to that dark place, even in our own minds, we, we fall short of this perfection, this vision that God casts for us. We fall short of the people that we know that we could be. And so legally, according to God's moral code, that creates a debt and something, somehow that debt must be covered. Well, I don't have enough blood in my body to cover the debt of my lifetime worth of sins, not to mention the sins I haven't even committed yet. How could I ever atone for all of my own sins? I don't have enough to go around. And God doesn't need my money or my grain offerings or anything. I don't have enough, I don't have enough blood to atone for everything I've done wrong. So what then? 
Well, the mystery, the, the tension created in Scripture is God is sort of standing at this crossroads where he could just sweep all of our sin under the rug and act like the debt never existed and just let the debt pile up under, under that rug like our, like our federal government's doing all the time. Just let the debt get bigger and bigger. And it's not really there. Don't worry about it. Pay no mind to the massive lump under the rug that grows bigger by the moment, that God could extend to us some kind of cheap forgiveness that doesn't really take care of the problem, or that God could come down hard on us and wipe us out and just be done with us for falling short again and again and again, as we all do. But the truly unique Christian truth claim is that God, unique to Christianity, God chose to enter the human framework, not only to teach us and show us or judge us, he became one of us so that for the first time in any courtroom known to man, the, the judge who sits on the throne of judgment, the judgment seat, once he levies the sentence, he himself receives it, absorbs it, all of it. And what we have in, in Christ is the image of a God who not only walked among us for a time, but took the cross as a symbol, a powerful symbol, a message to all of humankind that every debt we've incurred against moral, God's moral law has been assumed. He has taken it on himself. And every sin is therefore forgiven. Y'all, I don't know any, any other worldview that even comes close to making such a radical claim. Do you understand what this means? It takes all the, all the power out of coercive or manipulative religious uh, elites and institutions that try and have tried for generations to control people or, 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 or to get them to submit to the institution or to their leadership. It takes guys like me out of the equation completely because it's no longer about you coming to church and making your sin offering and hoping God accepts it and he's no longer mad at you. No, everything's taken care of. Every bill you've incurred is paid. Every spiritual debt already has been absorbed, covered by Christ himself by God in the flesh. This is such an unmatched, unimaginable kind of mercy. This, this kind of forgiveness is otherworldly. And this is at the heart of the Christian worldview. It's at the heart of Christmas. Why do we celebrate Christmas every year? Well, Jesus was born, yes, but Jesus was born to what? To forgive to save, to assume my debt and yours, to set us free. Gosh, what would happen if you really believed that today? If you believed that your worst moment can't define you, not only that it doesn't, but it cannot define you unless you allow it to, unless you choose not to accept the gift God's given you in Christ. Your worst moment has already been taken care of, your most shameful act already been paid for, your deepest debt, your darkest day, it's covered. This is a, this is a game changer. Uh, several weeks ago, a few weeks ago now, um, there was a, a police sergeant, um, Sergeant Richard Houston, who at 45, 46 years old, had served for 21 years on the, uh, uh, as part of the Mesquite uh, Police Department in Mesquite, Texas. And uh, Sergeant Richard Houston uh, answered a call to a, a disturbance at an Albertson's grocery store uh, earlier this month. It was a sort of domestic disturbance of sorts. Uh, a, a woman was accusing her her husband of, of cheating on her and, and she had caught him with her at the grocery store or something and, and things really escalated. And, and when Sergeant Houston approached the man in question, 
um, Jaime Hamarillo was his name. Uh, Jaime apparently panicked and um, ended up shooting Sergeant Houston, uh, fatally shooting this man who, by all accounts, followed God every day of his adult life, just always shined the light of Jesus everywhere that he went, just a devout follower of Jesus. Um, shockingly, at his funeral, his daughter, Shelby, who I believe, um, as best I can tell, was, is around age 14, maybe 15, around the age that Mary was when, when God called her to bear um, the light of the world, to bear Jesus and bring him into the world. Mary was very young, and this girl, Shelby Houston, absolutely brought the world to its knees by what she had to say, how she testified, not only to her father's faith, but to the object of her father's faith, to Jesus, and the difference that Jesus makes in the human heart. I want you to listen to her words, keeping in mind she's speaking at her own father's funeral just days after he was tragically taken from her and her family and listen to the difference Jesus has made in this young girl's heart. I know many of you knew my father as an officer. You may have seen him in his uniform with a badge and a squad car, but I saw my dad in a different fashion, always in his plaid pajama pants, book in hand, in his silver Ford F-150. Home has felt lonely without him here. I keep waiting for him to pull up in the driveway to come inside and tell us about some crazy car chase he got into, or maybe even how terrible the 7-Eleven taquitos were for lunch. <laughs> you never knew it was always a surprise what he had gotten into that day. However, there was no heavier surprise than to receive a call that your dad had been shot and killed. It will be a day I never forget. I remember having conversations with my dad about him losing friends and officers in the line of duty. I have heard all the stories you can think of, but I've always had such a hard time with how the suspect is dealt with. Not that I didn't think there should be justice served, but my heart always ached for those who don't know Jesus. Their actions being a reflection of that. I was always told that I would feel differently if it happened to me. But as it's happened to my own father, I think I still feel the same. There has been anger, sadness, grief, and confusion. And part of me wishes I could despise the man who did this to my father. But I can't get any, of, any part of my heart to hate him. All that I can find is myself hoping and praying for this man to truly know Jesus. I thought this might change if the man continued to live, but when I heard the news that he was in stable condition, part of me was relieved. My prayer is that someday down the road, I'd get to spend some time with the man who shot my father, not to scream at him, not to yell at him, not to scold him, simply to tell him about Jesus. That's the difference Jesus makes. That's the difference. That's what's unique about the Christian faith. Not only that Jesus is God in the flesh, and not only that Christ in us is how we live today. God has taken up residence in us, but that by the blood of Christ poured out on the cross, every sin you will ever commit and have ever committed has been forgiven. And you live to forgive when you follow Jesus because you realize that you're not the one who has to pay up for someone else's debts. You're not the one who has to cover anyone else's shortcomings because Jesus said he came to serve and not to be served and to give his life as a ransom for many. He is the ransom. His life was the price. It's already been paid. 
And we're just free to love and forgive. That, that whole image of overflowing with thankfulness is so important here because the reason we're overflowing with anything is that there's a wellspring in us now, springing up out of God in us, a wellspring of grace, and forgiveness pouring out of our hearts and into the world around us. We are overflowing and not just because of us and we're just really nice people. We're overflowing with grace because of Jesus and what he has done on our behalf. The unique Christian truth claims are that Jesus Christ is God, that Christ is at home in us and that he has forgiven all of our sins which takes me back to the song we're going to sing to close out this Friday night's or this Friday's services silent night holy night earlier in this message i poked a little bit of fun at that line sleep in heavenly peace and while i still refuse to believe that there was much heavenly peace to be found at the original nativity scene i don't i, I don't believe that's the point of that line or that song the point of that line, I think, is probably more about us and everyone who's come after the birth of Jesus and put their faith in him. The heavenly peace afforded to us through Christ cannot be compared with any other religious worldview or any other faith tradition. Sleep in heavenly peace is for all of us once we finally internalize the reality that when Jesus died on the cross, our sin did too. And in Jesus Christ, we celebrate a man who from the moment someone said it's a boy to the moment he said it is finished, showed us the true heart of God, the heart that beats in each of us who follow him now through his Holy Spirit, the heart that extends forgiveness and grace to every sinner, no matter what. That's what we celebrate every Christmas. Would you pray with me? Father, our, our little hearts and minds, we can't fully comprehend the, the vastness of your grace and just how big of a deal it, it is that you've chosen to cancel every debt, preemptively striking down every, every shortcoming. You've chosen to pick up the tab of our souls and our sins. God, and and we just don't get it most days. We still live as though we're condemned, as though we're working off some sentence that you already paid. Jesus, thank you for setting us free, for being our ransom, and, and, and for dying to cancel out every sin and every debt. Lord, we, we cannot comprehend this. We can just, we can just sit back and and, and, and just be overcome, overcome by your grace. And Lord, we thank you for calling us your home now because we realize that forgiving other people and, and being good enough, like it's not up to us anymore. It's you in us, you through us, Lord. And we know that your grace is a wellspring within us and we are just overflowing with thankfulness. We thank you for this Christmas as we get to celebrate the birth of Jesus yet again. Fill our hearts, Lord, with joy, gratitude, and yes, heavenly peace. And we pray now in Jesus' name, amen.